Make way, make way. Make way, make way. For the King of Kings. For the King of Kings. Make way, make way. Make way, make way. For the King of Kings. For the King of Kings. to our online service of morning worship on this Palm Sunday. Make way, make way for Christ the King. That's what we should be doing every week, but especially today. There are just a couple of notices, mainly to do with celebrations for Easter, 7 p.m., an agape meal at Christchurch. If you're not meeting in a home group, then you can meet here at Christchurch, but do let the office know you're coming. And then that's followed at 9pm by communion at Emmanuel. And on Good Friday itself, at 9.45, there is a Good Friday meditation here. And at 11, there is a Good Friday pilgrimage. We meet at Emmanuel at 11 to start that. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Today, we hear how crowds of people welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem, shortly before he was crucified. The people cut branches and laid them in the road before him, as they shouted with joy. God of joy, we welcome you into our lives, just as the people of Jerusalem welcomed Jesus with respect, love and happiness. Help us to remember that you are in all people and we should try to make everyone feel welcome. Amen. And now we come to that time when we have to confess our sins because none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes, we all do things that we shouldn't have done. So just take a moment consider what's been going on this week and confess those sins silently to God before we join together in the confession for today.
lets us admit to God the sin which always confronts us. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of all healing and forgiveness draw us to himself, cleanse us from all our sins, that we may behold the glory of his Son, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now Marion is going to read the Bible for us, and after that, Catherine will speak. This morning's Old Testament reading is taken from Psalm 118, verses 1 to 2 and 19 to the end. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O oh Lord, save us. O oh Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. The New Testament reading is taken from Luke 19, verses 28 to 40. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, tell him, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. After receiving the news of the Allied victory at El Alamein in 1942, Winston Churchill described this as not the end, nor even the beginning of the end, but perhaps the end of the beginning. And the end of the beginning is where we are now in our Gospel reading today. 
because everything that has happened in the story so far has led up to this moment, to the day we now call Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus arrives in Jerusalem. Perhaps you know the story well. You may have been coming to church for years and heard this every Palm Sunday. Or you may have been following the Lent course, either here or online, and therefore travelled in Jesus' footsteps from Mount Tabor to Jerusalem. Perhaps you know the story from Sunday school, with talk of a donkey and palm branches and shouts of Hosanna, whatever that means. Or you may not know the story of Palm Sunday as such, but you do know that it's connected with Easter next Sunday in some way. So come back with me to that day in Jerusalem early in the first century. The city is preparing for a great festival, Passover, in fact the greatest festival in the Jewish calendar at the time. A festival that celebrated God rescuing his people from their slavery and suffering in Egypt centuries before, that celebrated their freedom, reminded them of their identity, that they were indeed God's chosen people. However, they are not now free. They might not be slaves in Egypt or exiles in foreign countries as had happened too often in the past. They were, in fact, in the Promised Land. But Jerusalem and the surrounding areas were part of the Roman province of Judea, with a Roman governor, with soldiers and signs of occupation everywhere. However, this festival would happen every year and the people looked back deep into their past and then looked forward to a day when they would indeed be free. Into this situation comes Jesus. But before looking at his arrival, we need to look at some of those already in the city. I've already mentioned the occupying power, Rome, and the governor. We know him as Pontius Pilate, and we'll hear more about him later in the week. But at the moment, all we've had is a brief one-line comment from Luke, a few chapters before our reading today. Luke 13, verse 1. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. This tells us the event took place in the temple, the centre of everything holy, where people went to worship God. And what Pilate had done was to have these Galileans killed in the temple as they were worshipping and offering sacrifice. It was murder and sacrilege and sadly has all too many modern resonances. This happens all over the world. Pilate's concern was to maintain Roman rule and the authority of the emperor, to enforce the keeping of law and order and to root out any threats to Rome's interests. And, as the incident Luke tells us, he was also a nasty piece of work. In fact, he will one day go too far even for Rome and be summoned home to answer for his brutality but that's not for a few years yet. Today, Pilate has no idea who Jesus is. He'll know what's happening, as he'll be told by his countless spies and officials, that someone has come into the city and been hailed as a king. But should he be worried? Over the next week, we'll see how this works out. Then there is a king, the Judean king, Herod. He's a puppet ruler with limited authority, keen to retain favour with the governor, wanting things peaceful so he can get on with what we've already heard in previous readings is a somewhat debauched lifestyle. And Herod had been responsible for the death of John the Baptist, killed to honour promises made during a drunken banquet, again an occurrence not specific to the first century. And Herod is worried about Jesus. In Matthew's Gospel, we're told that when Herod heard all that Jesus was doing and preaching, he'd said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. 
And Jesus has also been warned about Herod. Not that he didn't know. Luke 13 again. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and told him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. And Jesus actually responded by directly referencing the individual concern, calling Herod that fox and contrasting his behaviour with Jesus' own. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people. And how he, Jesus, longed to gather his people together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Herod is the fox, Jesus the hen wanting to protect his people, an image which anyone listening would understand, and which, if reported to Herod, would be seen as further criticism. Jesus wanting to protect the people who Herod should be protecting. Is this a threat? And Herod will also hear about today from his spies and messengers. Jesus has come into the city and been hailed as the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And we'll hear more about Herod's role in the story as the week progresses. Then, as we've heard in our reading today, there are the Pharisees. They see themselves as the guardians of religion and morality. They want no contact with non-Jews, with no contact with Gentiles or Romans or any other sinner. And they have been following with considerable distaste the way Jesus actually associates with sinners tax collectors, soldiers, prostitutes, and with other ordinary people, without checking their religious credentials first. There are also the chief priests and the temple authorities, concerned with things being done properly, with the temple being respected and not defiled with people's blood. Jesus has already upset them by healing people on the Sabbath, and now there's a situation developing which could easily get out of hand. Then there are Jesus' own followers, disciples and others, including possibly the owners of the cult, waiting for the Lord to come and claim it as agreed. And the disciples include James and John, who earlier had asked Jesus, let one of us sit on your right and the other on your left in your glory. They might now be wondering whether this glory is happening. Jesus is being hailed by the crowds. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And the disciples include Peter, who together with James and John had been with Jesus on Mount Tabor when he had been transfigured, radiated light, the light that meant that he was God. Did what was happening today mean that the king was riding into his city, that God's kingdom was happening now? The disciples become a crowd, and the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And, as is the way with crowds, they grow, and everyone is probably joining in listening to the accounts of miracles, relating their own stories, and all shouting praises to God. All are disciples at that moment, all following Jesus, all hailing him as Lord and King. And yes, all shouting Hosanna. This word is only used in the Bible on this occasion. Luke, in fact, doesn't use the term. He's trying to explain it, to translate the shouts of praise for non-Jewish readers and hearers. Hosanna is a Greek version of the Hebrew Hoshana, meaning please save or save now. And when used in the gospel accounts of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, it's a cry for help, for salvation, and a shout of praise. The people who are shouting are not just asking Jesus to save them then and there. They are praising him for the help, for salvation he has already given and will give them, today or in the future. And this is the threat that is posed to Pilate, to Herod, to the Pharisees, to the chief priests and the temple authorities. If Jesus has already done so much and is being praised for what he has done, with words that say that he will therefore do so much more, 
has given salvation and will give salvation, then what does it mean? Is he really the Lord, the King, even the longed for Messiah, the one who will truly set God's people free? Is he in fact God? Will he overthrow Pilate and the Roman occupiers? Will he overthrow Herod? Will he even overthrow the Roman authorities, the religious authorities, everybody in authority? And there is also a challenge to the crowd of disciples. If Jesus isn't actually leading a revolution at the moment and is not about to overthrow Rome or Herod or any other authority, then what is happening? If you know the story of what we call Holy Week, then you will know what will happen next. If you have a Bible or can access one online, then you only have to look at the next few verses after our reading from Luke 19 to see that things are not going to go the way anyone expected. And that the chief priests and others start to make plans. Not the end, nor even the beginning of the end, but definitely the end of the beginning. But now, without rushing headlong to the darkness at the end of the week, or even to the new glorious beginning of Easter, we can celebrate with the crowd of disciples in Jerusalem and with all of heaven and earth as we join to sing, King of Kings, Majesty. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
we're now going to affirm our faith together to make clear our beliefs about Jesus and God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. And now Liz Slater is going to lead us in our intercessions. Father, as we've listened to the familiar story of your son's entry into Jerusalem, all within us cries out in praise and we join with the crowds in Jerusalem to shout blessed, celebrated and praised is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, you are King of kings and yet you are our Father. We come bowed before your majesty to make our requests known to you, knowing that you will hear all those who come to you in faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your church as we enter Holy Week and we reflect on your journey to the cross and the miracle of Easter Day. Please be with our clergy as they lead and manage the various services of this special season. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world that surrounds us in so much beauty at the moment. Help us to honour commitments to you that we may have made to protect your world. Keep us vigilant in praying, in caring, in our behaviour, in challenging, in taking action. Help us not to grow weary when we see only inconvenience for us and little steps being made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the peoples and nations of this world Lord, we ask for peace. We pray especially for Ukraine, for all those suffering such great loss of family, homes, possessions, for all those trying to leave to safer places, for all those now settling into temporary and permanent new lives. And we pray too for Russia, for the families who are suffering loss or who haven't heard from their sons or daughters. For those torn between staying and leaving Russia. For those who fear prison or death for speaking out. And for those whose only information is from state-controlled media. Lift up the spirits of Christians caught in this conflict let them know and trust that you are their strong deliverer, their closest friend. Strengthen them, surround them with your love, and let them be lights of hope to others in this darkness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we think of other areas of conflict. Thank you, Father, for the successful humanitarian food aid convoy into Tigray, for the ceasefire in Yemen. And we pray for peace for Jerusalem, where violence is breaking out as Ramadan, Passover and Holy Week coincide this year. Father, we pray for all leaders involved in all these areas of conflict and war, that you will work in their hearts. Lead them to a recognition that you are king above all kings and leaders and the Lord of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our own nation. Father, we see so much anxiety about the cost of living rising 
about the removal of statutory COVID precautions, about finding work, about getting urgent and non-urgent health treatment. Lord, guide our leaders into decisions that are honest, transparent, compassionate, with a determination to act for the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, we remember before you those who are ill. We ask for your blessing, comfort and healing on them. And for your strength and patience for all those caring for them, whether family at home, carers in residential homes, or health professionals in surgeries, clinics, hospitals and hospices. <clears throat> and we lift to you those who mourn with heavy hearts. Comfort them with the knowledge of your care and love for them. Restore and beautify their lives again with your laughter and your joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for ourselves, we ask that you will help us to fling wide the gates and welcome you unreservedly into our lives, into your kingdom within us. God of heaven, our matchless king throughout eternity, living in us, help us to live to serve your majesty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So now we bring our prayers and praises together and pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And finally, the collect for Palm Sunday. True and humble King, hailed by the crowd as Messiah, grant us faith to know you and love you, that we may be found beside you on the way of the cross, which is the path of glory. Amen. Our final worship song for this morning is Crown Him with Many Crowns. Please do join in as we celebrate Jesus the King. Crown him the 
shows his hands and side those wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified no angel in the sky can fully bear the sight but downward bends his burning eye at mystery Final notice is, just to remind you, that on Thursday we have the Agape meal, 7 o'clock at Christchurch, or meet in your home groups at an appropriate time, and then we will all join together at Emmanuel at 9pm for a final communion service before Good Friday. And on Good Friday itself, at 9.45 there is a meditation here, and at 11, there is a pilgrimage which starts from Emmanuel. And then on Easter Day, at 10 o'clock, there's an Easter Day celebration with communion and baptism here. And we look forward to seeing you at that as we celebrate the resurrection. Before we finish today, I'd like to thank Catherine for her sermon. Marion for her Bible readings, and Liz for her prayers. So as we close, Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light upon our paths, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all people in the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father, who so loved the world that he gave his only Son, bring you by faith to his eternal life. Amen. May Christ, who accepted the cup of sacrifice in obedience to the Father's will, Keep you steadfast as you walk with him in the way of his cross. Amen. May the Spirit, who strengthens us to suffer with Christ, that we may share his glory, set our minds on life and peace. Amen. Let's go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.